Hi everyone, Happy New Year. I just wanted to give a little New Year's update in this video. My last video on this channel was actually posted back in October. But that's because in October I started a fellowship with True North. They are a conservative media company. So I'm doing about one column a week and one video for them a week. So please check that out on tnc.news or on the True North YouTube channel. Something you may find a little fun and interesting is I submitted several freedom of information requests to Wilfrid Laurier University. I can't really say what they are because I don't want to in any way thwart my efforts to obtain the most information possible. But this is something I've been meaning to do for quite a while now, just for the sake of historical documents, accuracy, truth, etc. But crazily, uh, freedom of information requests or access to information requests they are neither free nor accessible. So in total, the information I'm requesting is going to cost me $3,195.14. And that's with a little discount they gave me because some of the records contain my personal information. So out of the requests I filed, I've only paid for a couple of them so far just because I don't have thousands of dollars to be spending on this right now. And for those wondering why they cost so much, um, they actually do give you a cost breakdown. So for example, you can see they charge for record search, record preparation, scanning, printing of records, and courier costs. And the most expensive, like the bulk of the cost is record preparation. The last book I read of 2019 was The Stream Runs Fast by Nellie McClung. So this book was written in 1945. Nellie McClung was a novelist, writer, mother, suffragette, and one of the first women elected to office in Canada. So in Canadian history, she is referred to as one of the famous five that got women declared as persons under the law, which meant they could serve in the Senate, etc. And she was a social activist that worked towards getting women the vote, or getting most women in Canada the vote. So I heard Nellie McClung was a eugenicist, um, but also that she was a maternal feminist who believed women should be in political positions because they are the natural advocates for women and children, and that's what they can bring to the table. And she was an advocate for temperance, so alcohol-free society. I thought this combination of being a feminist, eugenicist, and Christian temperance activist made for quite a complex character, which is why I sought out a couple of her books. The Stream Runs Fast is her autobiography, the second part of her autobiography, and as I mentioned, it was published in 1945, and I just want to bring up some highlights and interesting points. First point is that a lot of people think eugenics is inextricably linked with racism, so that if you were a eugenicist, you were also a racist. Um, when I posted one of Nellie McClung's quotes online on social media, I noticed quite a few people were referring to her as a racist and a white supremacist but they never cite anything other than her stance on eugenics. However, she was actually quite proud of her stance on eugenics and she addresses it in her book. She thinks eugenics is for the mentally deficient and she brings up the case of Katie in her book who is a person of Scandinavian heritage and is 18 years old but has the brain of a six-year-old and her mom got her sterilized. So I'm obviously not defending forced sterilization I'm just saying I haven't seen any evidence that McClung's stance on eugenics had anything to do with race. And I think when you're referring to past historical figures as white supremacists and racists without actually referring to anything concrete, I think you're kind of poisoning history. And further to that, after actually reading this book, you really don't get the feeling that Nellie McClung is in any way a racist or white supremacist. Let me read a passage from page 26. But just remember that back then the language was different. So they said colored people, not people of color. Or they said orientals, not Asians. So just try to look past that. Page 26. I remembered the story in Uncle Tom's cabin about the colored woman who was ordered by her cruel mistress to wean her own baby so she could nurse the white child. And how when her own baby cried, she was compelled to leave it in the cabin where its cries could not be heard in the house. It had shocked me when I read it years before. Now it filled me with rage. I wanted to do something about it. Okay, page 162. There were two Chinese girls of Victoria who applied for admission in the coast hospitals for training as nurses and were refused. 
They tried in Calgary and in Edmonton, but with the same result. But they were gladly accepted at the Lamont Hospital. Dr. Archer, who was and still is the superintendent, had no race prejudice, and the two girls were received and in due time graduated with honors and became valued members of the nursing profession. So she understands race prejudice. And also on this page, this is what Dr. Archer has to say regarding the Oriental question. The sooner we in Canada can come to the point where we speak and think of all as Canadian citizens and Canadians, disregarding or minimizing racial origin, the better it will be for Canada. Our American friends have done better than we have in this respect. I do not know what the outcome would be, and I would be among the last to minimize the importance of our British conventions, but it would appear to me very useful if when people become naturalized that they become full Canadian citizens, and by virtue of that Canadian citizenship, British subjects. So essentially this is something that is still said today. This sentiment is still in the media, political, academic class today, but it was written 75 years ago. Page 213, McClung describes a dinner she went to and some of the delegates were colored people uh, in her words. So bishops from the African Methodist Church, so presumably um, black, and she describes how some of the southern delegates refused to sit beside the black delegates at the dinner. And Nellie McClung was horrified by this. She says she wonders if they would carry their race prejudices to heaven. It was a sore shock to me to find that Christian people could be so cruel and ill-mannered. The colored people conducted themselves with great dignity, but my soul was scorched with shame for my race. And really, there are so many other examples um, where she describes an indigenous poet she really likes and, and saw perform. She talks a little bit about the rise of Hitler and how anti-Semitism is like moral decay. And our, so, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is this, are these the words of a white supremacist racist? Um, I think not. And the reason I'm bothering to point this out is because I think in Canada, we find it virtuous to be anti-Canadian. And part of that is demonizing our public figures from the past who might have been problematic, right? So, and in Canada, nationalism and patriotism, they're like bad words. And if you're constantly bashing Canada, it's like you're virtuous because you're aware of our genocidal, colonial, racist past. I just question, why are people so quick to demonize people from the past? They were just as complex back then as we are now. And it's very similar to this case I just covered in a video I did for True North of Matthew Bagby, who was a chief justice in British Columbia. A bronze statue of BC's first chief justice, Matthew Bagby, was removed from its stand outside the law courts in New Westminster, BC. Justice Bagby is sometimes referred to as the hanging judge. In a conflict known as the 1864 Chilcotin War, an English and American road building crew entered Chilcotin territory without permission. Because the Chilcotin didn't want their land conquered, and allegedly were concerned about the threat of smallpox and of men assaulting their women, they killed 21 of the English workers. Afterwards, five Chilcotin chiefs were invited to peace talks by the government, but they had been tricked. Instead, they were arrested, tried, and hanged. Begbie was conflicted about the decision to hang the five chiefs. He admitted the Chilcotin had been injudiciously treated and was appalled at how the men had been tricked into arrest. Alas, Begbie's statue was removed on the premise that it was a symbol of the colonial era, and taking it down was a necessary step towards reconciliation with Indigenous people. Local First Nation groups were reportedly cheering as the statue in New Westminster was lifted away. However, in his time, Begbie was actually well-liked and popular among First Nations chiefs, and he spoke two Indigenous languages, he opposed efforts to displace First Nations from their land, and he forced legislation that ensured First Nations women would receive their share of the estates of their English partners. And no one's really bothering to get the full picture. But yeah, otherwise, this book, it's like pure Canadiana, right? And it's very visceral. And that's refreshing because the sense I get from the media, academic, political class, as well as everyday people now, that I encounter, it's a, they have a superficial sense of being a Canadian that is very disconnected and uninterested in the pioneering of this country. And most Canadians, if you were to ask them how they feel about Canadian history, they would just say that it's boring. But I think you just need to know where to look 
if you ever find yourself in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, they have a museum called the Western Development Museum, and they recreate a Western boomtown that you can walk through and explore. So things like that museum, um, books like this that illustrate what it was actually like to be living in the 1900s, that's kind of what makes Canadian history more colorful. I guess that's it for my book club though. Uh, the next book I'll be reading is Bowling Alone. I'm not saying I'm gonna make a video on it, I'm just saying I'm going to read Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community by Robert Putnam. Interestingly, this is a book that came up a lot during my communication undergrad degree at Simon Fraser University. Um, the gist of it was, well, maybe we don't need to lament the loss of in-person relationships and in-person community because we're always connected to people online and we have our online networks and communities. And that's something I just uh, don't find appealing at all. So anyways, that's the next book I'll be reading and that's all. So bye for now, everyone. Thanks for watching.